to go ahead and get started. Good morning to all of you. My name is Lisa Lundquist and I'm the Dean of the College of Health Professions which houses the Undergraduate Public Health Program. Also in the College of Health Professions is Physician Assistant, Physical Therapy, Clinical Psychology, and Athletic Training in addition to Public Health. And we're excited that you're here. We think you've made a great decision to come to Mercer. We think you've made a great decision to strive to achieve your college goals and your career aspirations with us and in the College of Health Professions. In our time together this morning, we're gonna talk through a little bit more about the College of Health Professions and Mercer. We're gonna talk about public health and what your academic uh, trajectory is going to look like in your courses that you're gonna have and provide you with some tips and some pearls of wisdom as a new Mercer undergraduate student. And to give us all those pieces of information, Dr. Susie Madden, who is an assistant professor of public health here on the Macon campus, is going to, to share a number of things with us. Dr. Madden is an assistant professor and she is going to, you'll see her a lot um, as, as an undergraduate in public health because she'll be your professor in a number of your required and elective public health courses. So we'll turn it over to Dr. Madden. Welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to start off asking each of the students to introduce yourself and tell us where you're from. So, uh, I'm Yuki. I'm oh, <laughs> Okay. Um, I'm from Atlanta. Yeah. Okay, good. So not too far. My name is Sophia, and I'm from Warner Robins. Oh, okay. Oh, you're even closer. <laughs> Warner Robins. Nice. So it didn't take you very long to get here <laughs> this morning, did it? Well, welcome, welcome. So, um, Dr. Lundquist already mentioned this, but these are some of the talking points we're going to go over today. A little bit about the organization of the university and our college. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of information on the CHP, which is College of Health Professions, by the way, for academics, the administration, faculty, and staff. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the curriculum in the BSPH program and special consideration programs that we have um, are either of you pre-health track, meaning when you graduate, are you planning on going to med school, PA school, PT school? Yes, mm -hmm. what, what are you thinking? PT. PT, okay, what about you? Pre-med. Pre-med, okay, great. So um, we do have a lot of pre-health majors that come to public health, so that's great. And we'll talk a little bit about how that's a great synergy with public health and how our curriculum will actually prepare you for your graduate studies. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about your first year of college and some of the you know, tips for success there and a little bit about your UNB course that you'll be taking. Um, and then we'll also, I'm gonna sit down with each of you to review your fall schedules. Have you already seen a copy mm -hmm. of your schedules? No. <laughs> Do you have access to My Mercer yet? Uh, yes. Because it should be in my Mercer, right? Um, and if not, but we'll go over that. You look at your fall schedules, and I'll uh, point out to you what you'll be taking, what days, what times, uh, that kind of thing. If you have any questions, uh, we can go through that as well. Okay. All right. And if you have any questions along the way, feel free to raise your hand, and we can stop. basically how Mercer University, the Health Sciences Center is set up. So a little bit of background on, on the university, we do have 12 colleges or schools within the university, and those are listed over there on the left. So you'll hear a lot of other students say that they're in CLA. Have you heard that acronym yet? <laughs> CLA. That stands for College of Liberal Arts. And then we also have, you know, business and economics, engineering, education, music, tech, field law, theology, and then all of the health-related schools and colleges uh, are centered under this Mercer Health Sciences Center. So you can see pharmacy, medicine, and nursing, um, as well as us, right? We're the College of Health Professions. And so under the College of Health Professions, our college, we have public health in addition to clinical psychology, physician assistant, physical therapy, and athletic training. So administration, you already met Dr. Lundquist, she is our dean. Uh, Dr. Leslie Taylor is our associate dean, and uh, Dr. Turner is the chair of the Department of Public Health. And um, 
little bit of background just on our college. We do the, the main campus for the College of Health Professions is Atlanta because we have so many graduate professional programs. Um, but public health and also athletic training is housed here um, on the Macon campus. Now, if you're interested in a graduate degree in public health, that's offered on the Atlanta campus and also online. So that's great. Um, but just so you know, our administrative team is always also available. So um, Dr. Lundquist and Dr. Turner and even Dr. Taylor do come down to Macon, you know, pretty frequently. So um, they are accessible, just so you know, because I think some people have some concerns because our main campus is in Atlanta, but our administration is also always accessible to our students as well for making appointments and things like that. So our faculty and staff. This is a list of the Department of Public Health faculty. A lot of them are on the Atlanta campus. The ones on the Macon campus, which will be teaching you your BSBH courses, are myself and then Dr. O'Mary Mathis and uh, Dr. Gabby Darville. So those will be your primary professors in the program. We also have some adjunct faculty members that will teach courses as needed. And a lot of times our adjunct faculty are uh, members that work in the community. They may work at the local Department of Public Health or for the Georgia State Department of Public Health. So um, what's great is that they bring some of that outside real world experience as well into the classroom. Um, and then we also have on the Macon campus our new program administrative clerk will be starting in July. Uh, his name is Joseph Rooney. So you'll probably be hearing a lot from Mr. Rooney. So, an overview of our BSPH program. So first of all, when we think about public health and sort of the mission of public health and what do we do, um, we protect and improve the health of individuals, families, communities, and populations, right? It's on more of a global population-based scale when we think of public health. Um, what's great about our program is that we get you workforce ready, we get you graduate education ready, and we're also pre-health track friendly. What that means is because you're on a pre-health trajectory to go to graduate school, we, we specifically have sciences that will overlap with some of your requirements. So it will fulfill some of your med requirements, pre-PT, things like that. Um, and then for workforce ready, I do have, so in, in your packet of handouts, so there, you will find the one that says public health, what can I do with this major? Looks like this. So what this means is when you graduate, even with your Bachelor of Science in Public Health, you're workforce ready. You're, you're able to go into the workforce. If for some reason you decide med school's not for me, PT school's not for me, or I want to take a year off, you know, whatever. Um, public health prepares you and our program prepares you to go out into the workforce and do some of these positions with your bachelor's degree in public health. Okay. And of course, obviously we also prepare you or if you do decide to go to graduate school. Any questions so far? Any questions on that handout? Mm -hmm. Okay, so our program curriculum consists of general education courses plus your public health courses. And so that combined, we offer um, these skills, you'll be gaining these skills and knowledge areas within our program. So analytical skills, your critical and creative thinking skills, written and oral communication skills, things like that. And we also measure each of your skills through what we call competencies. And that is because our program is CEPH accredited, and that is the Council on Education for Public Health, and that's the accrediting body for 
um, schools and programs in public health to show that we are showing an excellence in education and we're meeting the quality standards that they have set for us. And so we measure your skills and knowledge through some of these areas, like specific projects or papers, um, service work. So each of our VSPH students is required to do 30 hours of public health service related work. So that's a component of the program. And then your capstone for your senior year, you'll be doing a portfolio where you're actually gonna be showing how you met all of these competencies, which is great because once you have that portfolio, you can then take that to employers, to grad school, to show, hey, this is, these are all of the things that I learned, and this is a great way to display your knowledge and your skills, you know, what you've learned thus far. Um, also, research. We give opportunities for students to collaborate with faculty members for research, um, and you'll be doing some research within your courses as well. Okay. So, general education, you also hear this known as Gen Ed, right? <laughs> So your Gen Ed courses. This is these are the courses that every student has to do. Whether no matter what your major is, you'll be doing Gen Ed courses. So for us, our foundational Gen Ed courses consist of all of these different credit hours um, within each of these categories. So communication, your religion courses, humanities, fine arts, all of those things. And if you'll notice, because we are a Bachelor of Science, we do have a higher requirement for scientific reasoning and quantitative reasoning that um, some of your peers that are in CLA may not have because they may have like a BA degree instead of a BS degree. And what's great about this is it prepares you for your graduate school for your pre-health track. So um, that's really great about that. And then your UNV course, right, that's one credit hour. And then you'll have some additional requirements, which we'll go over. So we have a oh, course checklist. So in your packet, there is a course checklist, which you will live by for your whole four years. We'll pull it out just like this. All the requirements is also in the university catalog, um, but what we've done is we've pulled that out to make this course list for you, this checklist. Do you not have one? I'll give you one. <laughs> Here. So the course checklist will show you all of the um, courses that you need that you can just check off as you take them. So for instance, when I sit down with you today to go over your schedule, we can look on your checklist and see where, you're, where you will be able to check that off. And um, students like this because it's like a to-do list, right? <laughs> and you go through and every time you get to check one off, you're like, yay, finished, closer. <laughs> so um, you will definitely be using that a lot. Now your advisor, your public health advisor, which will probably be either me or Dr. Mathis, uh, we keep our own checklist with you so each time you meet with us we keep a running tally of what you need what you've already taken things like that okay um, so what it consists of so public health the um, the public health side of that sheet oops we'll click here on that um, it consists of 45 credit hours which is six elect six hours of elective credit and then 39 credit hours of your required public health major hours. And then in addition, that includes your capstone requirement and then your service requirement, which I mentioned before. So any questions on that checklist? No. So the accelerated special consideration program. So for those that are on pre-health track, looks like y'all are leaning towards that. Um, so for instance, for physical therapy, we do have an accelerated program if you do want to apply for that. Um, I believe you have to apply by the 
fall semester of your sophomore year is the deadline for that. But so if you meet certain criteria, which are listed in the handbook, um, we have a program where you can complete it. You can actually shave off a year. So normally it would take you four years of undergrad plus three years for your DPT, but that would be condensed to six years instead of seven years, which is great because it's a cost savings, right? So then you have a year that you don't have to pay. <laughs> um, it is rigorous and there's high standards to be able to be eligible for this program, but it really is a great, um, it's a great track if you are a very determined and dedicated student. So if you have questions about that, our admissions representative, Laura Ellison, can answer more specific questions about that, and she can also help you to uh, figure out what you need to do to be enrolled in that. Okay. And so these are some of the examples, um, or not examples, these are the actual accelerated programs that we have. So DPT, PA program, um, athletic training, NPH, and then the clinical psychology. We do not have it for med school, unfortunately. But what we do have for med school is our special consideration program. So what that means is if you meet eligible admission requirements, you're guaranteed an interview. Do they have that for the med school before I say that? Mm -hmm. So they do. It's, it's um, nuanced, but yes, it, it okay. is a... <laughs> so as long as you meet the criteria that's laid out in the handbook, so be sure to check the, the handbook, um, what that means is when you graduate, you're guaranteed an interview. Not, doesn't necessarily mean guaranteed admissions, but you're guaranteed an interview, which can then lead to admission into the program. Um, and so I've heard some people say, well, that doesn't sound like such a big deal, but if you have certain programs, like I know DPT and PA, very competitive to get into. And if they're only interviewing a very small percentage of their applicants, if you're guaranteed an interview, that's, that's really big. So, um, so keep that in mind as well. So that's a special consideration program that's specific for our college. And um, like I said, if you have any specific questions about that, be sure to contact Laura Ellison. She can give you more information. Madden. Yes, sure. May I just say that with those programs that we've got listed as the accelerated special consideration mm -hmm. programs, there's also the opportunity to have special consideration as a Mercer undergraduate student because sometimes our students want to have the traditional four-year experience and not be um, accelerated in, in that undergraduate experience. Maybe you want to do Mercer on mission or you want to work during the summers and really take those four years for undergraduate. Um, our Mercer students that apply to our graduate programs do have that advantage because we know the, the education you're receiving as an undergraduate prepare you so well for our graduate pr program. And so um, meeting those minimum requirements on that traditional four-year undergraduate track, you're also guaranteed an interview even if we choose to not do the accelerated special consideration program. I just wanted to put that out there as well, that we really do value our Mercer undergraduate students in our graduate programs, and so we want to, we want to see you through that. Um, and Laura Ellison is also on the Macon campus frequently, and we hold some events for meeting to talk about um, looking at that checklist yes. and the prerequisites <laughs> for the graduate program you're interested in. And so just make sure you look out uh, for emails from her to have some one-on-one -on -one time. Right, yeah, she, she actually does do um, specific events just with pre-health students as well. So you'll be getting a lot of information from her. Okay, so your first year of college. Um, we'll talk a lot about your first year of college at UNB, which I will have uh, my PA over here. You wanna tell us a little bit about what we do in UNB and what it's about? So UNB is basically like the first year, come learn how to kinda live like on your own kind of class and we go over different things about campus and resources and like how to adjust and how to be more you know acceptance of people you may have never met before because it's college it's more diverse 
and things like that. And it'll be led by um, a PA and an advisor. So one of us in the black polos and then um, some of the different advisors. They try to group it by major as best as like scheduling will allow. So it's likely that you both will be in a public health um, O group and your PA will be a public health major and you'll have a public health advisor. But that doesn't always work, but it's okay because we get a lot of training on how to help you guys even if we're not in your major and the advisors are very well educated in all majors. <laughs> Our PAs are awesome, by the way. You'll, you'll, you'll love your O group. So once you get into your UNB group, what's great about that is it's a specific group that you can bond with when you come to college, you don't know anybody else. You have this group of people that you'll be doing stuff outside of class. You'll just be in, you know, margaritas for lunch or dinner or trivia or something like that. It's a great way to just sort of make some new connections when you're new and you're trying to meet people, you'll have that set group already in place, which is really great. Um, and I know my previous O groups, like, stay in contact the whole four years. They still get together for dinners and things like that, so um, it's really fun. Um, but some of the things that we'll talk about are things like personal freedom. So when you first get to college, you have that taste of independence, right? You don't have your parents waking you up in the morning got to go to class, you got to do it on your own now, right? Um, you know, all those things, making sure that you take time to eat, you're taking time to sleep, you're taking time to study, all those things, it's all going to be on you now. And so sometimes that can be a little stressful, right? And so what's great is we're going to give you some tools in UNB to show you how to manage all that, manage your stress levels, manage your time management, um, you know, things like that. So all of these things we will be going over in your UNB course, so it's something exciting to look forward to. So now we're going to go over just some basic information to help you succeed, which includes things like academic terminology, you know, first semester requirements, um, some registrar specific information, um, and then support services. So jump right in. So academic terminology. So your course checklist, which we've already looked at, like I said, you're going to, that's going to be your uh, Bible for the next four years. You're going to be living and breathing by your checklist. Um, also the catalog. You will get a paper copy of the catalog in UNB. Um, if they didn't already give you one, usually we think about UNB. But it's also online, which is great, because the online version you can just F and search for whatever you're looking for instead of trying to look through the big book catalog. So hours, credit hours. So for a typical class, it's usually three credit hours, right? So one credit hour is 50 minutes of actual seat time where you're sitting in class, except for things like labs, studios, and field work. So when you think of a typical semester, which is 15 weeks. That means you'll be going to class 44 times if it's a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or 30 times if it's a Tuesday, Thursday, okay? So just a typical scenario here, when you look at a full-time student, they usually go at least 12 credit hours per semester. So that's five courses and about three credits each, which would be 15 hours in class each week. But then in addition to that, you should be studying two hours for each hour of classroom instruction. So that's an additional 30 hours per week. So when you add that up, that's 45 hours of academic work. So what does that sound like? <laughs> A lot, but 45, it's a job, full-time job. Think of a, a regular full-time job is 40 hours a week. So School is going to be your full-time job. So don't let it fool you when you think, oh, well, my classes, I'm only sitting in class for a certain number of hours of, you know, per week. You have to put in the study time. You have to put in your homework time. You have to add all that up, and so you have to have some time management. Especially your first year, you're going to want to do everything. I want to do Greek life. I want to, you know, join this group. I want to do that. And that's great, you want to stay social, you want to meet people, you want to have fun, because it's college, but you also have to make time 
for your study. So this just shows you a little bit of how important that is. So UNB, we've already talked about this. Um, some of the things that, other things that we'll go over, uh, ethics, personal relationships, health and safety, future careers. I think we may even do one on budgeting, things like that, creating a budget. So you'll learn lots of information, valuable information. And by the way, I'll be your UNB advisor. So, um, and, and everyone that's in your group will be public health majors. So that's cool too, because it'll, you'll have, you'll see them in class, you'll see them in UNB, and you'll be with them throughout your four years. So INT, this is the communication requirement. And I'm gonna ask my PA to talk a little bit about what you did in your INT. Um, so my INT 101, um, I'm not actually sure what the theme of it was <laughs> because we just talked about like anything and everything that had to do with like living as just a productive member of society. So we covered different topics from like race issues to religion to sexuality to t all kinds of things like that. And it was an interesting class because it's very much like a grad school kind of vibe. Like we get an article and we read the article and then we come and discuss and there's lots of like good, productive, healthy, like group discussion. And I think it was really imperative to my first year experience because I feel like once you come out of high school, like at least in my high school, like we weren't allowed to talk about anything like controversial because they didn't want any conflict. So they were like, don't talk about anything, no elections or anything. And my freshman year was 2016 fall, which is when the election was going on. So it was quite an eventful class, but you learn how to like, have form opinions and portray them in like a educated, sophisticated manner and hear other people's opinions without like having to get angry or anything. And you also have to write some papers so you become a better writer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what the, the format of INT is usually is discussion based um, and then they have different themes for each year. And each INT is different depending on your instructor. So. Um, I've had some students, like, she said that she had one where, who are the real monsters? Are they, you know, the fictional Frankenstein type of monster, or is it real people in the real world that are monsters? And they made those connections, and they read certain books, and they wrote papers, and discussed, you know, things like that. So a lot of times you just have themes um, that are relevant, and it's really interesting. So I think you're really going to enjoy that. It's a lot different from when I took communications when I was in college. It was not that interesting. <laughs> so, um, so public health majors are not required to have an additional minor or double major like some of our peer colleges. So what that means is there's a gap between the amount of hours that you're required on that checklist for us, for the ESPH degree, and what you need to graduate. So in order to graduate college anywhere, you have to have 120 credit hours. Did you know that? Yes. So you have to have 120 credit hours. So if there's a gap of like, I think ours is 97 credit hours. So there's that gap between 97 and 120. And so you can fill that with whatever you want. You could do a minor, or if you're going specifically to a school, that you know needs X, Y, Z requirements, you can take those additional sciences. Um, so it's really up to you what you fill that sort of gap with. Um, and your advisor will sit down with you and talk to you about what might be the best classes for you to take, um, especially if you're going to graduate school, you know, to see what meshes well with your pre-health track and things like that. Um, but what's great is that we don't require you to do a minor, like some of the other you know, colleges. So sometimes you may want a minor, or, or some students minor in something that it doesn't give them all the requirements necessarily that they would need for their graduate education. So that's one really good thing that um, our program offers. So dropping and withdrawing a course. So there's a big difference between a drop and a withdrawal. So drop-in is really only done in that first week of classes. So that means it's completely removed from your academic record, um, but you have to do it within that first week. It's usually about a fourth day of class. 
So what that means is you registered for a, a, you know, a religion or something. You get to class, you think, I do not want to take this class. I need to drop that and take something else. So in that first week, you do have a little bit of wiggle room where you can drop something and then add something. They call it the drop-add period. Um, and you can do that without penalty. Now, if you stay in the class beyond that fourth day, then you're in the class, okay? And if you decide several weeks in, before say the 11th week of class, which would be the W deadline, you can withdraw from a course. Um, if you're doing really poorly in the course and you think I cannot handle a D or an F on my you know, record right now, so I'm gonna drop, which means you're gonna be actually withdrawn from the course because you're going after the fourth day of class, but before the 11th week of class. And so what that means is you will have a W as your grade. So you still took the class and you got a grade, but the grade is a W, which does not affect your GPA, but it is always on your transcript. So um, if you don't retake that class, um, when you apply for graduate school, they'll, they'll see that W. Now, if you retake the class, um, it can replace a grade, but you can only do that twice. Um, so also you need to ask the bursar's office about financial aid because sometimes if you drop below a certain credit hour, um, it affects your financial aid package because um, you have to have 12 hours to be a full-time student, 12 credit hours. So make sure you're always at at least 12 credit hours, but your, your advisor will make sure that you're doing that as well. So I know this is a little confusing. Does anyone have any questions? Um, be sure and check the catalog for all of the specific nuances when it comes to dropping and withdrawing because the registrar has some specific policies on this. So if you are ever thinking of doing this, make sure and look at those policies and make sure that you're okay with them, okay? But hopefully that won't happen. Um, excused absences, so sometimes you do have to miss class, right? Um, and, but then sometimes you'll have what we call excused absences, and this is if you are really sick and you had to go to the doctor. Um, keep in mind though, student health does not provide class excuses. So if you wake up in the morning, you're not feeling well, you go to student health, um, that's great that you can go to student health, but they're not gonna give you an ex a written excuse for your um, now, a lot of professors will allow you a certain number of days without penalty to be, you know, sick because it happens, right? It's life. Um, but a lot of professors are real sticklers when it comes to excused absences. So they will not, you know, mark it as an excused absence unless you have documentation. And so these are some of the reasons you may have documentation. If it's a university-sponsored <clears throat> activity, uh, if you do have medical documentation, uh, religious ceremonies, if you have a family emergency and have some sort of sufficient documentation for that that you can provide, um, legal and then obviously military obligations. So keep that in mind when you need to be absent from the classes. So transfer credits. Some of you may have had AP or other transfer credit hours from your school before coming here. Um, you may not see those right away. By the way, if you're logging into my Mercer, um, it usually takes, I think, till the end of July for some of those to be processed. So don't worry if you don't see them there yet, you know, credit for something. Um, it will go through. It just takes a little bit of time to process that. Um, also, <clears throat> we allow students to uh, take classes elsewhere and transfer them back in, and that's called transient. So say you go back home for the summer in Atlanta, and you have a college next to you that you want to go ahead and take your psych class or something like that and get that out of the way. So you're allowed to do that and then transfer that back in. You just have to make sure and look at all the guidelines and the policies for the registrar's office and within our program. <clears throat> and your advisor will work, work closely with you to make sure you're getting the appropriate course that you want to transfer in. Um, we do have 
some residency requirements. And what that means is residency means the classes that you take here at Marshall. So your 15 hours, you have to have 15 hours of upper division coursework in the major here. You have to have six hours of upper division coursework in a minor here, if you're also doing a minor. And then your final 32 hours of courses taken before graduation have to be taken here. That means you can't go somewhere else for like your last year <laughs> and take 32 credit hours somewhere else and then try and transfer them back in and graduate from Mercer. They won't let you do that. Okay. Any questions about any of this so far? No? Okay. Uh, repeating courses. So um, definitely be sure and check the catalog for the current restrictions and allowances because it's a very detailed policy. Um, usually, if you take um, a course and say you have a D, so you had a D in a course, you can't repeat that course on a satisfactory or unsatisfactory basis instead of using a letter grade. Some students don't even realize that you're, you can actually do that. You can register for a course and instead of getting a letter grade, you can do satisfactory or unsatisfactory. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you did. <laughs> Have you ever done that? No. Yeah. <laughs> there's some students that I know that have, that, have, that have done that, but so there's lots of nuances around this type of thing. So be sure and check your catalog. Um, if you do decide to do that, talk with your advisor. Make sure it's the right decision for you um, and for your GPA and things like that. Um, now, if you have a poor grade in a class here and you think, oh, well, I'll just take it somewhere else and transfer it back in, you can do that to satisfy your graduation requirements. So say you failed a class here and you take it somewhere else, you transfer it back in, you, you know, get a B, that's great. But that failing grade is still gonna be calculated in your GPA. So only courses repeated at Mercer will replace a grade. Does that make sense? So if you took it elsewhere and transferred it back in, you can count it towards graduation, but it won't replace the grade. Now, if you take it here, though, it will replace the grade, which, like I said before, that's great, but you can only do that twice. <laughs> okay. All right, so student rights, privacy, and services. Um, you have the right to inspect your educational records. Um, if you, can, you can always request a copy of your educational records. Um, an important uh, policy here is about the FERPA form. Uh, you will receive your FERPA form at, I think there's a fair that you go to, right? The resource yeah. fair. So there's a resource fair that you're gonna go to today. Be sure and fill out your FERPA form if you want your parents to have access to your educational information. And so what that means is, so if I have a parent that calls me, uh, which I do, I have parents that call me all the time, and they want you know, specifics about a student's grades or how they're doing in a class, things like that. I have to look up the student in the system and if you don't have that FERPA form filled out, we can't discuss any specifics with your parent. Um, and some students want it that way and so they do that specifically, but many students want their parents involved and they don't realize that they have to have that form. So be sure and fill that out today. Um, um, also, like I mentioned before, you know, the first year of college and really your whole four years <laughs> can be really stressful, right? You may have things that happen. You may have family members that pass. You may have issues with friends or boyfriends or girlfriends. And, and um, you know, you just sometimes it's hard to cope with things. And we have free, um, free services here on campus that we call CAPS which is the counseling and psychological services. And I've had so many students that go to CAPS and they love it. They think, oh, I'm really stressed out, it's finals week, I'm having panic attacks, what do I do? And they don't realize that they can just go to CAPS, they can talk to someone, they can help you work through things, um, and it's all free. So please take advantage of that. We'll talk a lot about that in UND as well. And we'll have someone from CAPS come and do a presentation which is great. And so you'll hear about all the different services. They offer a whole wide variety of services at CAPS. Um, 
And like I said, it's all free, so you want to take advantage of that. Um, if you are a student that requires accommodations for a specific type of di disability, you have to fill out um, some specific paperwork and register with Disability Support Services. And only students that are registered through that DSS are eligible for accommodations here at Mercer. So if you do have some sort of a disability, please make sure and go and fill out your paperwork. You're gonna to wanna to talk with your professor the first week of class, talk about your accommodation needs, things like that, very important. So keep that in mind. Um, this is more about accommodations. Like I said, talk to your professor first week of class and make sure that your accommodations are all set up. We have an actual accommodations office here. They're great. They can help you out, work through any of the paperwork with you, navigate that system, all of that. Okay, so utilize opportunities. There's so many different opportunities here that I feel like students don't take advantage. So you're obviously your advisor. You're gonna meet with your advisor. You're required a certain number of times a semester, but you can always come and talk, because I'll be your advisor. You can always come and talk to me anytime. Um, I do have specific office hours, but I'm usually always in my office if I'm not in class. So, you know, feel free to come by and talk to me about your classes. If something's going wrong, you need additional help, I'm always happy to help you. Um, utilize the Academic Resource Center, it's free. This is the one that I feel like students do not utilize enough. The Academic Resource Center has tutors in specific courses. We even have a public health tutor. So if you're having trouble in one of your public health you know, courses, you're taking biostats, and you're like, oh, I can't get this one thing. Go and talk to the tutor. It's free. They'll, they'll help you out. Um, you know, they're great. For a PA, you never use the ARC. <laughs> Yeah, I work there. <laughs> oh, see? Great. So what other resources do they have at the ARC? They have like all the books from all classes. They have like one copy of every book. So right. if you have like a book that you like either are waiting for it to come in or something for the first like couple weeks of school, you can go there and use it. They have like a printing. There's one or two places you can print on campus there in the library. They have like the bear card, add money to your bear card things. They have computers. Um, yeah. <laughs> water bottle filling station. <laughs> yes, these are in addition to other things. Um, if you are pre-health, which sounds like both of you are, you want to make sure and follow the guidelines, which means you should be meeting with Dr. Bocros, and then you'll also probably meet with Laura Ellison, who is our admissions person as well. She likes to meet with all of our pre-health students too, so you want to just make sure you're checking your email. That's a huge thing for first-year students. Always check your email, because that's going to be your official way to get all your information, to get your invitations, to get all that stuff. Um, like I said before, CAPS, you want to utilize that. The resource fair, you're going to learn a lot about other resources at the resource fair that will help you succeed. And then another great resource is the Center for Career and Professional Development. And so your senior year, it's actually a requirement that Dr. Mathis, who teaches the capstone, she requires all students their senior year to visit uh, the Center for career and professional development. But I encourage you to go before then too because they help you with building your resume, writing your resume. Um, you know, if you're undecided about what you want to do or you're thinking, oh, I was gonna do med school, now I'm thinking about PA, or you know, th there's lots of, of resources there that they can, they can help you with for your career development, for your career path, professional development, all of that kind of stuff. And again, Um, okay, so this is a campus map and it shows uh, where we currently are, which is that blue circle up there, which is Newton Hall. And I think y'all were in Newton Chapel this morning, correct? So in that same building in the back, that's where we currently are. We're on the bottom floor. So if you need me or anyone else before August 1st, we'll be there. Um, after August 1st, like when classes start, we will be down in Willett. So we're in, in the process of moving this summer. So currently, we're in Newton. You need us in the next few weeks. Um, after that, we're gonna be in Willett on the third floor. Okay. Um, any questions? I know I threw a lot 
of information at you. It may take some time to process. Do you have any questions now about anything I talked about? No? Okay, well you're gonna think about it and you'll have questions, right? So when you do have questions, um, feel free to, I'm gonna give you one of Mary Matheson's, Dr. Matheson's cards. She is our program coordinator for the BSPH program. And she can answer questions, I can answer questions as your advisor. Um, but just in the meantime, if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to email her, call her, any questions. And if not, I will go over your schedules now. And we can see what you're taking, see if you have any questions. 